So it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the second seminar on uh, the mathematics of machine learning in the One World seminar series. And it's also my great pleasure to welcome Eric van den Einden to give this presentation on the trainability and accuracy of artificial neural networks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much for this invitation. I'm, I'm very happy to be here to, to give you this talk. So, um, as Stefan said, what I'll be discussing is uh, some result that we have obtained uh, recently on the trainability and accuracy of uh, neural network. This is joint work with Grant Rotskoff. I mean, the project started with him, and since then, uh, Grant was a postdoc uh, working with me at Courant, who is now uh, going to Stanford. And, and it's uh, since then I've started working on this with a few other collaborators, including John Bruna, who is my, my colleague at the Quran, Sam Yalassi, who is a student, and Zeng Dao, who is another student uh, in computer science and math, respectively. And so what I would like to, to discuss a little bit is, in some sense, it's a viewpoint that, that we have pushed forward to try to understand or to analyze neural network. And to begin, what I would like to discuss a little bit is uh, the conceptual uh, changes that have been brought by machine learning, what, what uh, one could call the unreasonable effectiveness of machine learning by paraphrasing uh, the title of paper by Eugen Wigner. And uh, so, I mean, I want to insist on the conceptual aspect rather than the practical aspect that are very well known. And I'd like to do that by uh, putting two things in perspective. On the one hand, one achievement, uh, which are flag chief achievement in machine learning, namely uh, AlphaGo or Go Zero, which, which uh, is a machine that taught itself to play Go and, and from the ground up, meaning just knowing the rules, and uh, managed to become very quickly the best player in, in the world. And so I'd like to put this in perspective with uh, a, a phenomenon that uh, was studied quite a while ago, and that is called the curses of dimensionality. That's a term that was uh, coined by Bellman in 61 in the context of uh, optimization. And, and uh, if you want to know more about it, there are very nice paper by uh, Dave Dono in 2000, and then more recently by uh, Stefan Back, uh, Francis Back in, in, the, in the context of a uh, neural network. So what does the curse of dimensionality say? Well, it says essentially that if you want to do operation in high dimension by exhaustive search, either optimize, integrate, or approximate any of Lipschitz function to a certain precision, the number of operations that you need scales exponentially with the size of, uh, with, the, with, the, with the dimensionality. And as a result, you know, this curse of dimensionality was the reason why uh, scientific computing, in particular with PDE, was believed to be a low dimensional affair. I mean, meaning if you had to solve an equation PD, partial differential equation using finite element, finite difference, method of the sort, then it was believed that this was doable if you were in low dimension, two, three, maybe four, but not above that. Now, this concept of curse of dimensionality it took a hit in a way uh, with the achievement of machine learning, in particular the game of Go that they introduced, because if you think about the game of Go as an input output you know what is the state of the board and you need to figure out where you need to put the next stone this is actually mapping a function in a very high dimensional space there is 10 to the 117 or about uh, legal position on a 19 by 19 board of uh, go and so this seems to um, lead to the question which is well, maybe actually the curse of dimensionality in certain instances can actually be beaten. It seems that's the case, for example, of the Go. And so the question, which will be the underlying question of this talk, is really to ask when, how, and why can deep learning or machine learning approximate high dimensional function? Because if somehow we could do that, this would offer an enormous number of new possibilities, in particular in scientific computing. So in order to begin with that, we need to understand uh, the specificity of machine learning that make it quite different, in fact, from what is typically done when we try to approximate function uh, in, in scientific computing. And there are three aspects that I would like to emphasize here. 
which makes the, this approximation quite different. The first one is that if you look at a neural network or a deep neural network, it's a very nonlinear function representation, as opposed to, again, a Galerkin truncation or anything that is based you know, on Galerkin truncation, where at the end of the day, these are linear representation, a sort of a set of parameters or weights that you need to learn. And so the first question is that we need to quantify what's the approximation part of the neural network. There's another aspect to the question, namely that typically when you, when you learn uh, with a neural network, you learn in high dimension, which means that the data that you have at your disposal is sparse. Again, this is very different from what is typically done in scientific computing, where one, when you want to solve a PDE, typically you look at it on every grid point at your disposal. This is no longer possible in high dimension. And so again, that's something that needs to be understood what, what are the implications of this. And finally, and related to the other two uh, issue, since the nonlinear function, uh, since you have a nonlinear function representation, uh, as a result, training a neural network is a non-convex optimization problem because, well, in general, you cannot assume that the, uh, the, the, the loss landscape, I'll introduce that in a minute, will be convex in the parameter. And so one needs to understand the conversion of the optimization algorithm on this rugged landscape, which is typically what you should expect, and in particular of the one that are, typically, that are used in practice, namely gradient descent of stochastic gradients. So in this talk, I will uh, focus mainly on, on the, the first and the third aspect here, since in some sense, the realization error is a byproduct of a certain result that I will you know, uh, go over. Okay, before doing that, and just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, I, I'd like to re remind everyone of uh, the ABC of neural network representation and training. And I'm doing that, I'm well aware that most of you are very familiar with this. I'm just doing this in a way to fix notation uh, and so that we are all on the same page. So again, what we're gonna be focusing in this talk is the problem of function approximation. And so we will assume that there is a target function F, which uh, is a mapping from some set omega could be in high dimension, the input dimension is D, could be large, and we will assume there's a scalar function. And what we do is that we represent it by a neural network. And so what is that? It's essentially a superposition of nonlinearities or units. Uh, so that's what's written in, in the equation, in, uh, the first equation on the slide, where the, the, the parameter, so what I've discussed here is the case for the moment of a two layer network with input weight, which are Z and output weights that are denoted as C. And I will use a compact notation by lumping all of these parameters, all these weights into one set of parameters that we call theta. These are the fitting parameters and phi, is an activation function or a unit. So you should think, for example, uh, of the VLU, which is written there. And, and, and so you would imagine that you know, the target function could be, well, either something that comes from data, but more generally, it could be the solution of a PDE, like Schrodinger equation, or the force field, if you want to do molecular dynamics, the force field that you want to estimate, or any function that you'd like to estimate, and you have some training data that, uh, that is available to you. So, how do you adjust the parameter? Well, first, you need to introduce a, a measure of the discrepancy between the representation, the approximation by the neural network and the target function, and that's what's called the loss. And typically, one, one, one loss that is fairly uh, widely used is essentially the, the weighted L2 norm of the, 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 the difference between the target and its representation. So it's a, you can think about this as an expectation over the data, the input data of F, the target minus Fn square, Fn being the, again, the, um, um, the, the, the representation by a neural network. You, you should keep in mind also that if you do scientific computing, you might not need to have training data. For example, the, the loss function could be of similarly quadratic and self-contained, the one that is written in red on, on the slide is simply uh, the, the, the objective function that you would need to do if you want to solve Schrodinger equation. Now, of course, you cannot, one cannot in general estimate the loss function explicitly. And so what is done is that instead of uh, doing the expectation completely, what you do it is you do an empirical estimate of it on some data set. So you draw a certain number of XP from the data distribution mu, which you call the batch, and you do the empirical average 
of the loss over this data point to get the, the, the end breaker loss. I will assume in this talk that there is no uh, error on the training data, meaning that if I give you XP, we know what F of XP is. So there's no error on the Ys, if you wish. And, and this is called what this is M breaker risk minimization or ERM. And then finally, the, you know, the, the final aspect of this is that you need to train the, the parameters. And so how do you train the parameters? Well, the typically what is done is to do gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, which is essentially uh, taking steps in which you take the gradient of the empirical loss and you push the parameter downhill uh, with respect to the gradient with a certain training rate, which is uh, delta Tn. So this uh, summarizes what, you know, a training a neural network is. I mean, this is, of course, there's many more tweaks that are done in practice, but, but this captures the essence of what needs to be done. And, you know, so main block is neural network representation, which is written in the first equation, the empirical loss and the stochastic gradient descent. And maybe to avoid confusion, uh, I will insist upon one little notation tweak, namely that N here denotes the number of units, not the number of data points, and P denotes the number of data points. Okay, let's keep that in mind. This notation is not the, the standard one that is used, though this varies from word to word. Here, N will be the number of units, and P will be the number of data points. And to repeat again, if you look at you know, these three main building blocks, the three puzzles that are associated with it is the one of optimization, does the stochastic gradient descent converge? So meaning, oh, well, can the network be training practice? That's one. How does the error of the train network scale with its size? Meaning the number of units, that's the approximation error. And then how does it scale with the size of the data, which is P, that's the generalization. Okay. Now, the first aspect, there is one aspect in this, if you forget about training, which is in fact known for quite a long time. And this is these are results that are, uh, typically referred to as universal approximation theorem. And what these results essentially say, I'm going to give you a heuristic, is that there is a hope, in fact, to beat the, you know, the curse of dimensionality if we think about the neural network representation as an expectation. So let me try to explain this in a foreign way. So suppose that I consider this uh, sum over the units that's written in the first equation on the slides. And let's imagine that the parameters, the Cs and the Zs, or the weights in this uh, representation are drawn independently from some probability distribution mu. So they are random parameters and I pick them independently each from mu. Then, and this is the reason why you may have noticed that the way I've done the superposition over the units is a weighted superposition. I put the one over n in front of the sum from i equal one to n. Then if you take n going to infinity, you can think about the, the sum in the representation of neural network as an empirical average. And so there's two results that you have immediately at your disposal. One is the law of large number that tells you that Fn will converge to F, which is what? It's simply the expectation of the units with respect to the target, the measure that you have uh, drawn the parameters from. That's uh, the, the line that is written there, Cd mu. And we're going to take the, the expectation of Cd mu so the integral C d mu for z will be denoted by d gamma. That's a, a radon measure. We'll get to that in a second. So that's the first result is lower large number. And then there's a second result that you have, which is central limit term, that tells you that if you want to understand something about the rate of conversion of fn towards f, well, you can take the discrepancy between fn and f, scale it by a square root of n. Again, that's the width of the, the network. And we, the central limit term tells you that this will converge to some Gaussian field uh, eta x. And so heuristically, if you want to write that, this says what? It says fn can be thought as f, the target, plus some error, which is a Gaussian field that scale like one over square root of n. Okay. And so what you recover here is the Monte Carlo error scaling, which is of all the one over square root of n, rather than the scaling that you would get by if you were to do um, complete enumeration, which is one over, uh, one over n to the one over d where D is the input dimension, okay? They are constant in these uh, results that, are, you know, that, that needs to be controlled, and we'll get to that. But in essence, this is saying that the Monte Carlo scaling, which we know is useful in the context of numerical integration, right? Instead of doing numerical integration a la Bellman, where you would do it on, you know, on, on a grid, you can do it by Monte Carlo. This scaling could actually also be useful in the context of function approximation, and that's what neural network seems to be about. 
So this result, of course, are well known, and they were quantified a long time ago by uh, studying the work by Baron and Shebeko and Park. And this is what I already told you is uh, called, uh, called universal approximation term. If you want to read about them, there's two nice papers by Francis Back in Journal of Machine Learning Research in 2017 that you could take a look at. And they say essentially, if pi is discriminatory, meaning it's nonlinear and non-polynomial, then if you have any f in L2 uh, with respect, to, so weighted L2 with respect to the input uh, distribution, then there exists a rather measure uh, that were denoted by gamma star, which is such that you can approach f to arbitrary precision in L2 by a function which is just the expectation of the unit with respect to this radon measure. So it's the integral of phi hat d gamma. And on top of that, the function f star can be realized because you can use result like the law of large number, which tells you that if you draw every pair from this gamma star, from a measure mu star, which is such that this uh, marginalization over the z's only is the, 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 gamma star, the, the gamma star, the right on measure, then uh, this f star, this superposition will converge as n goes to infinity towards the f star. Okay. So what does this say in essence? Well, it says the, the universal approximation term quantifies the theoretical approximation power of neural network via its capacity to represent function in a norm space, which, which uh, is this denoted by F1. And these are all functions that can be, a bit of a topology, it's all functions that can be represented as the expectation with respect to the, 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 the radon measure of the unit, okay? Um, these spaces have been studied recently in a paper by Er, Ma, and Wu, and have been termed barren space because they were first introduced or, um, by, by Baron. There's, in this paper, there's a generalization to deep neural network. For the moment here, we're focusing on, on two-layer network. So universal approximation term gives you the power, the approximation power in that. It says you can learn function in that space. And it also gives, in principle, a Monte Carlo error bound simply by realizing this approximation by doing uh, uh, random draws, okay? And in principle, it also allow you by analyzing what is, this, what is the, 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 the nature of this space, which is not intrinsic space, a space that depends on the unit that you use. It allows you to quantify what is the quality or the adequacy of the unit for the problem at end. The, it, so it allows you in principle to understand what is the quality of the neural network architecture given the function that you want to represent simply by looking at what the space is. And, and there's nice work about this uh, in the two papers that are uh, cited, uh, you know, with Schrebro on one hand and then Er and Wachowski, Wachow, which um, they have also looked in this problem uh, recently. Now, what the universal approximation theorem doesn't tell you, and that's what I would like to focus on now, it doesn't tell you how to obtain this optimal measure gamma star. Uh, in, in particular, it, it doesn't give you uh, what is the approximation and the generalization error after training. You need to remember that at the beginning, we don't know what this measure is. We need to train the network by stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent. And so the question is, is there any practicality in these results since it's, at this point, it is just an existence result, not, not uh, a, a, a convergence result, if you wish. And so that's the problem that I would like to address in, in the remaining of this talk. That's really what we have been looking at. So let's, to understand what's going on, let's think about neural, you know, the training of a neural network by gradient descent. And so let me remind you, we have a loss function, which is this, this uh, expectation. For the moment, I will discuss this as if it was the true, you know, the, the, the population loss, but if you were to replace everywhere population average by empirical average, so you, the whole formula would generalize. And so the first thing that you realize is that if you, if you look now at the function representation approximation by the neural network, you can write explicitly what is the loss in terms of the parameter and is the function that is, is this L of theta one, theta n, it is n units again. And it is essentially the superposition of, uh, so there's three parts. There is a constant that depends only on the target and, and, and not the parameter. Then there's something which is a function, which is essentially the, the, the expectation of F times the, the unit over the data. 
that's the term capital F of theta. And then there is a, a, an interaction between the units that is captured by the expectation of phi phi, which is the term k. And if you do training by gradient descent over the loss function, what you essentially do is that you take the gradient of this loss function with respect to the parameter, and then you do step of, of, of steeper descent. For analysis, it is um, easier or, or, or to think about this as in continuous time. That you can then analyze what's going on by discretization of this ODE. But if you look at this continuous time, the, the gradient descent becomes a, a, a simply a, well an ordinary differential equation, which tells you that the, the 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 time derivative of theta i is the gradient of the loss with respect to theta i, and in with the structure that we have at end here, it gives you the equation that is now written on uh, the the screen, the last equation on the screen. And as I have said already, this can easily be generalized to uh, the empirical risk minimization, the IRM setting. You just need to replace F and K by the empirical average. And it can also be generalized if you do stochastic gradient descent, meaning if you don't do the, uh, the empirical average over the whole batch, but over many batches, okay? So once again, the difficulty that we have here is that if we look at the loss, because the unit is nonlinear in the parameter theta. In general, this loss is non-convex. In fact, one can assume in, in general that it will be fairly rugged landscape. And so there is a priori no reason why if you do gradient descent, if you look at the solution of the equation that is written, the last equation on the slides, there is no reason why the, this dynamic should not reach the first local minimum on the loss that close to the, the, the initial value for the parameter, and why this local minimum should be any good in terms of representation power of the neural network, okay? So that's one of the puzzles that you would like to understand. In order to do that, there is, and that's the key of the viewpoint that we push forward here, there's a way to think about this by realizing first that at the end of the day, we don't need, we don't care that much about what the parameter are doing individually. In the neural network representation, the, these parameters, which from now on I will talk about as particles because I will think about them as interacting particles, these parameters are interchangeable. Their label is not very important. And the only thing that matters, if you want to know what is the function representation that one has when you do the gradient descent, is in fact the empirical average of the unit over the impact, empirical distribution of these parameters. So on the slides, the empirical distribution is denoted by nu n, is the sum of Dirac at the position of the, of the parameters. And the only thing that I would like to know is in essence, or F, Fn t evolve, or more generally, all this empirical measure evolves, okay? And why is that useful? Well, it is useful for two reasons. First of all, one can write down an equation, so we can write down a PDE, for the evolution of this measure. This equation needs to be interpreted in the weak sense, but essentially what you, this is a chain rule. I mean, if, if you take the time derivative of the measure and, and then you, you use chain rule and you use the equation for theta and a few integration by part, you realize that you can write down for this equation, you can write down an equation for the empirical distribution. And this equation is nothing but a nonlinear linear equation or in a jargon of physicists of Vlasov equation for the system of interacting particles where uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the, the particles are evolving over an empirical potential, which is just the one that is written there. Is v. So this is, it is useful to think about the problem in these terms, because if you do so, you can use the apparatus that allows you to analyze what happened to this equation when you take n large, meaning when you take the infinite width limit, if you wish, of the neural network, and this comes with the name of uh, hydrodynamic mean field limit. So I have, I mean, I have a little illustration. It's a movie. I'm not completely sure the movie will play very well by Zoom, but I will try anyway. <clears throat> so this is an illustration, which is in, from an example that has nothing to do in a way from neural network, but it's illustrative anyway. What, I, what the problem here, I mean, the setup here is simply we have particles that evolve in a potential, which is the one that is shown in the background, so double well potential, that's the F term. So it's the one, one particle interaction term, if you wish, in, in the loss. But then there's something else that has happened that is put in, is that these particles repel each other. And so if the particle, if there was no repelling force, if the particle were independent, 
the blob of particle that you see here would just collapse essentially onto the, the minimum it's sitting up. So they would just all shrink toward the minimum on the potential at the right. But because the particle interact with one another and repel, what they will try to do is to kind of, there's trade off they want to do, which is that they want to remain low on, on the energy landscape that you see, but they also want to kind of become further and further away from one another. Okay, and so if you run the dynamics, what you obtain is this, is that this is what the particle do. They actually flow from one potential to the other and kind of equilibrate the mass in the two potential because that's the way to kind of put the mass, kind of put the mass on the landscape in such a way that all particles remain more or less low in energy individually and also as far apart as they can without increasing too much the, the energy that there is from the one particle interaction. Okay. I think the movie makes it clear that you, what hydrodynamic limit mean, you can see that there is a flow of something that is going on. And you can also see that in an example like this, you don't really care what the particles are doing individually. Again, what you care really is what they do in distributional sense. And that's what the, the mu n captures. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that you can, the mean field limit says what? It says that if you take n going to infinity, the measure, the empirical uh, distribution converts to a distribution as n goes to infinity, which satisfy an equation, which is essentially the same equation as before, except that it cannot be solved with an initial condition, which is smoother, for example. This is simply the initial condition, the mu zero, is the distribution with which you draw the parameter initially, okay? And this equation is interesting because this equation is in fact a gradient flow in a specific metric, which is the Wasserstein metric, I'll get to that in a minute, over essentially the loss, but now viewed as uh, the, the, uh, a functional of the empirical distribution or the distribution rather than the parameter itself. And so that's what I denote by E of mu. And as you can see, even though this function is nonlinear in theta, it has become quadratic in mu. In other words, if you think about the lost landscape from the viewpoint of the distribution of the parameters rather than the parameter themselves, it becomes convex, at least in the linear topology. Okay? And you can think about the evolution that you have. So there was a gradient flow. At the beginning, there is a gradient, I mean, at the level of the particle, there is still a gradient flow at the level of the measure. And this gradient flow is, in fact, uh, the one that was written there. One way to understand it is by thinking about it as a gradient flow, a Wasserstein metric. And what does that mean? Well, the best way to maybe the simplest way to understand it is as the, the, time, the, the time continuous limit of, of a proximal scheme, sometimes denoted by a Jordan Killer auto scheme, where what you do is that every step, you try to minimize the difference between the, you know, the energy plus a penalty, which is just the distance of the, the new measure that you update in Wasserstein metric. Say this may link with the optimal uh, transport. This is not very important. What is important at this level is that the ruggedness of the lost landscape viewed by the particle primary disappear if you look at it from the viewpoint of the empirical distribution. Okay? And, and this is something that uh, Grant and I uh, put forward in, in a paper in, in 2018, and pretty much at the same time, uh, Song May, Andrea Montanari, and, 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 and collaborator uh, put a, a paper, in fact, two weeks before, also analyzing the mean field. And there was another group uh, around Sirigano and Spiliopoulos that also discussed this. Wayne and, and, and uh, Mayan Wu have, so Wayne and uh, Mayan Wu have also discussed this in the context of what they call the continuous viewpoint. On, on machine learning, and that's the, the last reference that is on this slide. Now, there is a little, uh, we, there is a little, uh, there is a little more work that needs to be done with this because, unfortunately, the convexity of the landscape in the in uh, in, in the linear topology is not enough to guarantee conversions of the solution of the Vlasov of the mean field equation towards minimizer. And that's because the, the, this dynamics is not, is not displacement convex. So you don't have the convexity with respect to the right metric. But there are, you can work a little bit further on this. And essentially, you can show that for specific architecture, in particular, the one that we are discussing here, where you have input weight and output weights, the, the spurious uh, stationary point cannot be reached dynamically. 
meaning if you have well-prepared initial condition, what the dynamics will actually converge towards uh, the minimize, minimizer on the, the loss for the, the merger mu. And since this loss is convex, every minimizer will actually be a universal representer of the function. I'm not going to go into details of this, a little bit technical, but in essence, that is because the energy that we have here is not really an energy for probability measure, but it's an energy for radon measure, which eliminates a constraint that is typically what prevents in standard problem involving optimal transport or gradient descent and washout and flow conversions toward the minimizer. This problem disappears here because, of, because in a way the, the, the energy is degenerate. It's an energy which is on this radon uh, measure. So if we summarize what we can actually show, and that's the first proposition that I will list in this talk, it's a law of large number or mean field result. It essentially says this, it says that if you take a finite representation so, uh, of the, 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 the neural network, so finite width, and you train in this representation the parameters uh, by gradient descent, and you look at this Fn, then as n goes, so if you take the width larger and larger, this function representation has a limit, and this limit is such that as t goes to infinity, it converges towards a target in F1 in the barren space. And on top of that, you can show that the limit commute in T and N. Okay? So in essence, what this is, if you wish, a dynamical version of universal approximation term that tells you that not only if you're in F1, there is by definition a measure that allows you to represent the function, it tells you that you can actually reach it dynamically, provided that your network is large enough. Okay? And these, these are, again, results that were uh, put forward for, you know, in the paper with, with Grant in 2018. And if they've been proven rigorously uh, in specific set, set up by Elena Ekshiza and Francis Back in the other paper that is uh, listed. And, and since then, there's more results that they've been obtained, in particular about the convergence rate, which the convergence rate here becomes to leading or independent on n, but it could depend on the input dimension d. And these are paper by Shiza and the paper that are listed at the bottom of the page. Okay, I just want to make two remarks about this uh, this result before moving on. One is that it's important to realize that the parameter may converge to many different values here. The 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 the, 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 the landscape one needs to remember remains rugged at the level of the parameters themselves. It's simply that. For every one of these local minimizers that you have at the level of parameter, they are, if the, again, if the width is large enough, essentially equivalent in terms of function representation. Okay? For statisticians, this is essentially saying that the model is not identifiable, but in a way that doesn't matter if the only thing that you care about is the function representation that you have by the network. One has to notice also that this means that this is a very different type of approximation than the one that is done in standard numerical analysis because again the parameter that you get could be if you train the network twice you could perfectly well get two different representations they are just equivalent in the mean field or in the in the law of large number limit okay now what these results don't say and that's the next uh, important question is it doesn't tell you anything about the convergence rate in n meaning all oh, why does the network need to be in order that Fn be close to the limit Ft. And of course, since we know we can go back to what the heuristics that I said at the beginning, well, we know that if we, in static problem, the way to go beyond the law of large number is to do the CLT. And so now we have here a dynamical version of the law of large number. Well, we can also write down a dynamical version of the CLT. What? It means that if you take well-prepared initial condition, meaning you draw the parameter from some distribution mu zero independently <coughs> initially, then you can show that the CLT scaling, which obviously holds initially, it is preserved by the evolution. So what does that mean? That means that if you take the empirical distribution, mu n t of the parameter, you, sub you subtract from it its limit and you scale that by square root of n, then this object converts weakly in the sense of measure and in low to a Gaussian measure as n goes to infinity. And correspondingly, it says that if you scale the, so if you take the neural network representation at finite width and you subtract, that's Fn, and you subtract from it F, which is its limit, you scale the difference by square root of n, then this function converts pointwise towards the Gaussian field as n goes to infinity and again converts in low. 
okay? And one can write down an evolution equation for the Gaussian measure omega t. And these results are also fairly well known for a long time. Uh, they, they go back to Brown and App and Stisman, et cetera. But what's new, and, and we did in a paper with uh, uh, Joan Bruna and Zeng Dao Chen and also uh, Grant Roscoff, is actually to show that um, you can analyze what is going on with this equation if you take t going to infinity. In other words, not only do you know that the CLT scaling holds for finite time, but it also doesn't deteriorate as t goes to infinity. And so one can state the result in the following way. Namely, that if again you take the function representation fn, that's what's stated as proposition two, the approximation error. So if fn is now the function representation at fi finite width, where the parameters I evolve by gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, and you initialize them for well prepared initial condition, again, that's what's done in practice. Then, if you take the expectation of the difference, this, you, this is just about the second moment here because I want to talk about the loss, but there's a statement about also you know more, more standard CFT but if you take the expectation of the difference between f and t the finite width approximation and f you can scale this you take the square of that the expectation you can scale this by n send n going to infinity you have a limit and then you can send t going to infinity and you have a finite limit as well where the constant is again related to to the the baron norm of the target function if you wish and you can also show, which is quite remarkable, that the error that you get is always better than the one that you get by resampling error. In other words, if, it would, if, if you knew what was the optimal measure that comes in the universal approximation theorem to draw the parameter, instead of drawing the parameter from this empirical distribution, if you do that, it would be better to still train the network to optimize this would decrease the error. And so this validate the Monte Carlo error bound with a constant that is known a priori and again related to the, 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 the barren norm of the function. And, and these results were uh, discussed in the paper with Grant in 2018. There were other results in particular by Sirigano and Spidiopoulos who also discussed the central limit term, but they didn't really look at what happened in the long time limit. And we, we have revisited these results in a way which is more precise in the paper by Joan Bruna that is uh, quoted on uh, well, that will appear in the archive soon, we hope, okay? So this is the approximation error. So this validates the fact that in principle, we can be the, you know, the, 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 the curse of dimensionality, at least in a statistical sense, because the Monte Carlo scaling is valid also for the function representation. Of course, again, I insist on that each time we see one of these constants, the constant here could depend on the dimensionality. So one needs to take some care into trying to understand how, you know, what, what are the functions that they have small barren norm in a way. Once you have obtained these results, you can actually think about what happened if you train the network by stochastic gradient descent on the empirical loss, right? And then where everything happened in the same way, if you wish, as what I've said before. But then if you ask, well, what happened then if I take the approximation that there's been done by empirical risk minimization, and I just look at what happened, you know, or does it generalize outside of the training set? And I mean, these are fairly standard results, so I, I'm not gonna dwell upon it, but essentially, if you have the result about the approximation error, you can again look at this in function space, and it says that at the function space level, that's the generalization error. If you take the expectation of the loss, which has been trained at finite data set minus the target, and then you take the expectation that over the batch, there is an error which is of the order one over square root of P where P is the data set. Interestingly, in order to get constants here that are controlled, one needs to guarantee that we learn by controlling the norm, uh, again, the bar norm. And in order to do this, the, the one needs to regularize the loss. And uh, so there is an extra term, which is the, the proportional to lambda, which is the constant that we use to regularize uh, the loss. So if you put together proposition two and proposition three, so if you look at not only the generation error, but the approximation error, and you put them together, what these results suggest essentially is that if you take a finite width neural network, but the width is large, and you ask what is, will be the generalization error that you get after training, so the total error, so finite width, finite batch size, and you ask what will be the error that you have uh, afterwards. So the, what, what you end up having is that this error 
is in principle bounded by one term that controls the approximation error, the C over N, first term in the inequality there, then one term that controls the error that is uh, because of the finite cells of the batch, which is C prime over square root of P, and then a little, uh, I mean, a, a little, add, you know, what, what you have to give up, which is simply the cost of regularization that you, that you have, with constants that are again explicit and depend on the round norm of the function, okay? So the, 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 the key point here and the key take home message that one needs to, you know, that I want to emphasize here is simply that, I mean, this result says that there is no overfitting if you take n going to infinity. So in other words, the result that I given here are results that I obtain if you take n going to infinity. So if, if you take over parameterized network, take n to infinity first, then the size of the data set to infinity next, so over parameterized network. And it essentially says that you shouldn't worry about uh, having over parameterized network as long as you can control the, the, the norm, the, the baron norm of the function. So in other words, you can say that in another way, don't worry about the width of your network, simply worry about the scale of the weights. That's the, the, the take home message. This will guarantee that you have uh, capabilities and approximation error after learning of these neural networks. Okay. There is a few generalizations. So this is pretty much, you know, what, what I have discussed here is, is pretty much the, the, the end of my talk. I, at least the, the core of the result that we have obtained in terms of this law of large number, the CLT, and then, you know, what they imply for approximation and generalization error. But I'd like to make a few comments in addition to that. The first is that this continuous viewpoint is interesting because it allows you, in principle, to modify the gradient descent in order to accelerate conversion. So let me elaborate upon this a little bit. So what we have done so far here, I have shown you how we can essentially take a scheme which is defined at the level of the particle and then use this continuous version where you look at the empirical distribution to try to understand what is going on by looking at the evolution of the measure. Okay, so it's, a, it's, it's an analysis tool. But now we can do something else, which is that we can, in principle, modify the equation at the level of the measure itself to guarantee conversion. So here is a modification which corresponds to using unbalanced transport. They are worked by Shiza, Perry, and all that, where you add term in the equation that are the terms that are proportional to alpha in the first equation on the slides. And these terms, have, they guarantee no conversions of uh, the, the, the measure towards the minimizer in much uh, uh, wider condition than if you just use optimal transport because there's no locality. I mean, so you, you can, so you can analyze that they correspond to a change, if you wish, of, of the proximal scheme. But there is something that is interesting that you realize when you do this, namely that this modification that is done at continuous level, so at the level of the measure, can in fact be easily implemented at the level of the parameter of the particle. So you can modify uh, the, the, the stochastic gradient, the, yeah, the, the SGD, the, the gradient descent of the stochastic gradient descent in such a way as to implement this dynamics that has better conversion property. And how you do that? Well, you realize that the term that you have, the additional term proportional to alpha, can be interpreted as a birth death, essentially. And what do they say? They say that every particle, or parameter, if you wish, is com comparing, you can compute the value of its potential, okay? And then it compares the value of its own potential to the value of the potential of all the other particles. And particles that have high, high potential are their fitness is bad, if you wish, in particular, they have low potential, have a good fitness. And so they can decide based upon that, that particles that are unfit disappear, that's just removing nodes in the network. And the one that disappear, in fact, you put them into other nodes that no duplicate. So good nodes tend to reproduce, bad nodes, it's an unbalanced transport, if you're non-local. And if you do that, and that we proved that didn't work by uh, with uh, uh, Sami Gelassi, Joan Brunner, and Graham Rotskoff, you can actually show that you can guarantee conversions to the global minimizer of the energy in much broader condition than if you were to use unbalanced transport, which would be the case when alpha is equal to zero. So that's one thing that can be done. Another reminder that I want to do, but this one is more work in, in making. There are works in this area, in particular by Jin Feng Lu and Lei Xing Ying, and also by Wayne and Herbert. I should have put it here, but I didn't. But essentially, what one can do, this picture can be generalized 
to deep neural network of a certain type, in particular ResNets. And ResNets are what? I mean, it's essentially, a, you know, they, they have the convolutional structure where you construct the function by iterating upon one layer network, if you wish, or two layer network each time. And if you do that, uh, what you can show is that there is a picture that emerges, which is the same way, in, in fact, you, look at, you need to look at the parameters of the network in every one of the layers. And for every one of the layers, we need to look at the empirical distribution. So if you do that, you can write down again an evolution equation for this empirical distribution and look at this mean field limit. The complexity here is that the, to try to guarantee, to guarantee conversions in time of the evolution there is more complicated because the network becomes, in fact, even at functional level, non-convex in the linear topology. So there's more work that needs to be done. Okay. Um, maybe, you know, I'm almost done. I just want to make one more remark, which is a comparison between what is now referred to as the mean field limit, which I would prefer to describe as hydrodynamic limit or more generally as this picture with interacting particles, and another scaling limit that has been uh, analyzed in the literature and which is referred to as the neurotangent kernel, which was introduced originally by Jaco, Gabriel, and Angler, where they analyze what happens if you take infinitely wide neural networks, but instead of scaling with one over n, as I was doing when you do the superposition of the unit, you scale them as one over square root of n. Okay, so uh, this essentially amounts to changing the initialization, and I'll give you uh, the, reference on the next slide about that by, in particular by Shiza and Back that nicely analyzed that. But one can try to understand what is going on if we train network in this scaling limit. So, I mean, there is, so there's many ways one can look at the problem, but there's one thing that is quite obvious here is that in order for this function to have a deterministic limit, if you scale it this way, one needs to have that essentially the parameter don't move very much because one needs to go back to the mean field scaling. Okay, and so this requires two things. It requires that the theta i that you have start from a value theta i zero that satisfies centering condition, either in law or in you know almost surely, which is the condition that if you sum the units at the initial value, they go to zero, they represent zero. And then if you do that, you can essentially, you can uh, expand, tailor expand the unit around this initialization. And what you end up having is the line that's written in the middle of the, of the screen where what you have is that now you go back into the scaling of the mean field. But there is one important thing that has changed is that now the parameter, because it's a linearization, the parameter enter the network the parameter that you need to optimize upon are the theta tilde only, and they enter the function representation in a linear way. So that means that in essence, you can relate in this scaling, you can relate the learning to what is done when you do a, a random kernel uh, approximation, meaning where the random, you know, the, the random parameters are the theta i zero and you just adjust the weights. Okay. If you do this, the analysis is of course much simpler because everything is no linear and in particular you know in in the mean field scaling we can write down an evolution equation for the, for for the function representation but it's a non-linear equation because it involves a kernel that depends on the measure that's itself evolving that's the first equation that's written there the dtft right where m this kernel this positive definite kernel that depends on mu t Whereas in the NTK scaling, you get a similar equation, but the kernel that you have is now at mu zero, which is just whatever you picked as distribution for your, your, your random features that are now fixed. Okay. And as a result, if you do that, well, the analysis of the conversion NTK scaling is much simpler, but there is no free lunch. And because NTK is random feature uh, kernel matter, what you end up having is that instead of learning in the right baron space, which is what we have been discussing so far you know, in the F1, right, where you can approximate any function which is such that it has, it can be represented in that space with a, a random measure which has finite total variation, the NTK learn in a space of function which is essentially an, an L2 space in which you need to have that the weights have an L2, I mean, a, 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 the, the, the second moment 
is finite with respect to the measure that we have taken a priori. And since you don't know it, this potentially means that you're learning in a much, much uh, smaller space. And, and the, what the, the few reminders they made here have been, you know, first put, for, I mean, first put forward by Shiza and Oyano and back in a paper where they analyzed the scaling. And then there have been many papers since then that are the one listed at the bottom of the page that actually confirm, uh, you know, this, um, <clears throat> This conclusion saying it's easier to learn in that scaling, but the price to pay is that you, you have, in general, a much smaller space in which you can learn, which also means that the error that you make are much bigger because if the space is smaller, even if your target function is in that smaller space, the constant, the norm that it will have will be bigger. Okay, that's the essence of the paper that are listed there. Okay, so this essentially is, is the end of my talk. Uh, so what I have tried to, um, to convince you he about here is that this continuous viewpoint of machine learning, you know, taking the jargon that was introduced by, by Wayman and, and, Mine and Wu, is quite useful for analysis, meaning you, you should really think about a neural network as, as, as in a continuous limit where you think about them as taking the expectation of units with respect to measure, and then you ask whether you can train these measures in an efficient way. And these results support the empirical evidence that neural network can outperform standard interpolation methods and massively reduce the cost of representing function in high dimensional space. That means that at least if you take this viewpoint and you're happy with uh, you know, Monte Carlo type error, then you can beat the, the curse of dimensionality and have an error that scale like one over square root of n. Okay. This obviously offers exciting possibility to perform self-reputation in new and much more efficient way. And, and these, these, uh, you know, there's an explosion of work these days into this area in, in molecular dynamics, in, in free energy calculation, in solving PD in high dimension. And, 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 you know, and I think this is really only the beginning of something very exciting that is happening. There is, however, obviously, you know, a caveat or a little warning that needs to be done, which is, of course, uh, in all of these representation, they are constants, and these constants can be fairly bad. They can depend on the dimensionality, and so one needs, if we want to use neural network to do scientific computation, these networks need to be tailored to the problem at end to guarantee that these constants themselves remain fairly small. And when I'm talking about the constant, I'm talking about the approximation error constant, the generation error constant, and also the constant that you have in, in the, the, the um, the, that one, in fact, is not a constant. It's the rate of conversion that you have at mean field uh, limit that also uh, could depend badly on dimensionality if you don't use the right training algorithm or the right network. And there is some work by Wayne and Stefan about this. Um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for this presentation. And um, I imagine there will be uh, questions, uh, uh, questions now. And um, I think the first one is about to be asked. And let me, let me allow the, so um, hopefully, Hopefully, people can, can now stop sharing the screen, or we keep it that way for time. Keep being. it that way for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you for unmuting me, and uh, thank you so much for the uh, for the very interesting talk. I have two questions. One is uh, a more technical one. In uh, in your slide on generalization, you had this uh, regularization with a Baron norm, and then you had the this parameter alpha, and I was wondering how you need to choose it as a function of the uh, number of data points, for example. Uh, you mean lambda? Yes, the lambda. Okay, so let's. Uh, you mean okay? So th this okay, the, the lambda there is is the strength. So you know, I, I didn't discuss that, but essentially, what you need to, you know you need to add in the loss uh, a penalty term that penalizes the norm, the baron norm, if you will, of, of the function that you learn, okay? Uh, and, and whatever penalty term you, you, you put, the scale is proportional to lambda, you get it back in the approximation error here. Now, 
what you can, sh I mean, so in principle, the result says that no matter how small, as I mean, taking lambda to zero is a singular limit, if you wish. No matter how small this penalty term is, it will guarantee that you control the norm of the function. However, there is a catch, namely that the smaller this parameter, the longer the, the time it will take to train, because essentially the penalization will only act on time scales that are you know, one over lambda. So what, what the error here tells you, and I think that you know, they are, they, this is in a way standard if you do uh, scientific computing, is that you know, if, if you look at the, the, the last equation on the slides, it's essentially telling you that you should put all the parameters on the same scale. Okay, so I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to be concrete except in simple example here, but essentially if you knew the constant, meaning the C, the C prime, and, and, and the bound norm of the function that you would have here, right? You could minimize the error that you had. I mean, if you give yourself one of the parameters, say I have a network, I mean, I have a network of a certain width, right? Then I could minimize uh, over all, I mean, the, the parameter to put them all on the same scale. M more generally, if you want to have that the, the error that you have is below a certain threshold delta, right? And you know the constant, then you could, minimize the error over n, p, and lambda. The, the catch being, again, that as far as lambda is concerned, its value will impact the convergence rate that you have for the training, and so that should be taken into consideration as well. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything more concrete to tell you about because it depends crucially on what the constants are. Well, but that's concrete enough, thank you. Uh, and I have another uh, kind of more general uh, question uh, on Baron spaces. Is there anything, so Baron spaces are spaces of functions with certain properties. So functions going from finite dimensional spaces to finite dimensional spaces. Is there anything similar for operators between infinite dimensional spaces? Uh, I mean, okay. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know this video question maybe for Stefan in fact, more when and than me, but, but, but um, the, I mean, the, the barren spaces are not finite dimensional spaces, right? They, they are function space themselves. They sure. are not Hilbert space, they are Banach space, they are metric space, right? And they are not intrinsic in the sense that they depend on the unit that you use. So if you change the unit, you change the space, mm -hmm. right? But, but they themselves are already, you know, function space. They are not, I mean, there's no, nothing that is finite dimensional in them. And in terms of operator, I mean, to the extent that you can, I mean, if, if these are integral operators with kernels and then the kernel itself would be, you know, in, in a barren space, then the, the same type of result would apply, I guess. Okay, so I, I understand that the, uh, the barren spaces are function spaces and they are infinite dimensional themselves, but every element has a finite dimensional uh, domain and a finite dimensional range. Right. And so it's, it's a function and not a, an operator. Not an operator, yes. So, I mean, you're, you're, yeah. so then, then, then that's, I mean, I, I, this is a question, I, I don't know. We should discuss that offline or, or ask the question to Stefan, actually. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, uh, my quick question is uh, with regard to um, the universal approximation theory. Uh, you did mention something about uh, the fact that um, it's not able to give the optimal values from the neural network, if I had it right. Could you please explain the drawback of the uh, universal approximation theory again? Now, what I say, I mean, <clears throat> so, the, I mean, so, the universal approximation theorem, mm -hmm. right, are, are an existence result, if you wish. They say, and, and, and they are all, they say that in principle, they quantify what I mean, true, true, you know, work of Baron essentially, and then others, they quantify which type of function can you learn in using units that are discriminatory, and and they also indicate that the you know the fun these functions are dense in a, form a space that's dense in L two, and you can it's a norm space, and you can find what its norm is, right? Mm -hmm. Now, these res these all results. Uh, I have one caveat associated with them is that in the original setup, there was very little that was said about how to actually learn in that space. It, it, it says, it's, again, it's an existence result. 
And he said, in particular, if I train a network, even with large width, by gradient descent, for the reason that I explained at the beginning, and in particular, the non-convexity of the lost landscape, there was very little guarantee that existed that you would actually reach the optimum. Meaning, what you, you could, you know, there was no guarantee that if you train a network this way, you would actually reach a representation or, or a discretization of the optimal measure that you need in the universal approximation theorem. Okay. And so the, the result that I have not that I have discussed here, which you know, is this continuous viewpoint on uh, machine learning is actually telling you, well, in fact, under certain circumstances, etc., the, the one can, if you learn by gradient descent, you can realize universal approximation theorem dynamically. That's the okay. take-home message, if you wish. All right, thank you. So, <clears throat> maybe I can ask one quick question. Um, so, uh, it seems like it doesn't really necessarily depend that much uh, the results on the fact that you have really one layer networks, but more that all of these individual networks, sub networks, if I may call them that, like that, don't share their weights. Is that an, a reasonable interpretation? Because you essentially yes. need to have their weights to be adapted by stochastic gradient descent. But yeah. they don't so, have I mean, to be. You, you know, you could imagine that the unit that you use, there's two cases in which you could introduce depth. Okay. And both of them are, in fact, uh, you know, limited, but, but maybe not that much at the end. One is that the unit that you use, the individual unit that you use, could have a convolutional structure. Meaning you could imagine that, you know, the, the way you construct a, a unit is by taking a function of function of, I mean, you know, so that, that theta is not like, there's not two layers of weight, but it's a more complicated function. But you would still need that at the output layer, you make a superposition of all of these units with the one over n scaling. That's one case, okay? And, and that doesn't encompass the, the standard architecture that are being done in deep learning. Or there's the other case, which is the one you know, with the slides that in fact was incomplete in terms of reference, because as I said, this is this slide. They are worked by Lei Ching Ying and, and Jin Feng Lu about this, which are, okay, sorry, here. I'll go to that so that I show you. There is a structure, I mean, you can also use a, a structure which is the one of ResNet or certain type of ResNet. I mean, wh where essentially what you do is that the, the way you, you, you construct, you know, you construct a function and then you pass this function, you take the, the, you take the function as input in an, a layer and, and in a new network and then you do that again and again and again. In, in the slides is K times, right? Then in every layer, you can have a mean field limit. And so is the, I, I, I mean, I, 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 does that answer the question that you were asking? In this case, you have, so you can generalize the mean field limit. It's just that the measure that you have is no a measure that lives on a you know, bigger space, or if you wish, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, measure, and it's a product measure, which is of, of the, the parameters that are in every of the network. Oh, I'm sorry, every other layers. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I'll unmute Jian Feng Lu. He has another question. Uh, hi, Eric, thanks for a nice talk. So uh, you mentioned this result by adding the birth and death term. I was just wondering whether you have like a similar dynamical CLT result for that training dynamics. In particular, can you show, for example, the variance is smaller in the birth and death process? Um, okay, so in, in um, we, that, that one is in fact part of the reason why the paper is not yet posted on the archive. It's a little bit more, it's a bit technically more involved if you add the birth death process and it depends a little bit on how you implement the birth death. In fact, there is a way to avoid altogether the birth death by using a lifting where you introduce weights for every of the network. And we are analyzing what is happening uh, in that case, in terms of we have the dynamical CLT can be written down 
But analyzing what happened in the long time limit is a little bit more tricky in that case. But we believe, I mean, so that we, we are holding on the result a little bit at this point, just to be sure. But th the bottom line is that we believe that in this setup also, what you're gonna get is that the error that you get after training beats the scaling, the CLT scaling that you, so, the, so is in the CLT scaling, but beats the constant that you would get if you were to do uh, resampling from the, the, the optimal measure. Does that answer your question? I said thanks in the chat, so I think yes. Okay. I don't see the chat because I still only see my slides. Um, Human, uh, are you are you um, yes, fine asking uh, a question? Hi, Eric. Nice right. talk. So, I in practice, have... the baron norm of the target function is unknown. So, how do we know that it is not too large or even infinite for popular machine learning examples like ImageNet? I mean, this is you will need something like this to show that this is indeed the mechanism at play. I mean, this is, you know, this is a very, very interesting question. And, and uh, let me, and, 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 and I think it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an area in which we should really, you know, if you want to do scientific computing, uh, so not only it could, you know, we need to address it, but actually looking at the viewpoint and, and using machine learning to do scientific computing could help. Let me try to explain. So if you're asking me, if you know, if you if you ask whether the, the you know the bar norm of the classifier between cats and dogs is, is is small, that's a very difficult question to answer because in fact it's a fairly imprecise question because it's not completely clear what exactly is the underlying function that classify between cats and dogs. But if you look at the problem from scientific computing, say, I mean, this is a very ambitious problem, but imagine that you want to do the quantum you know, multi-body problem and you want to solve Schrodinger equation. Well, then at least you know that this function, there's a ground truth. There is a solution of, to this problem. It's just, it's a, in principle, a complicated function. And then, but you can, in principle, analyze what is the baron norm of this function given the architecture of the network that you are using. Okay, I'm not saying that is an easy question, but at least it's one that is well formulated and in which there, you know, that you can now start to investigate, which is how, you know, how do you design, I mean, more generally, how will you design network that guarantees that if you want to learn function in certain class, for example, solution of certain PDEs, their baron norm will be small. And you know the the work that I quoted by Nati Srebro and by Wayne and Er, I mean, are you know are, are, are looking into question to you know how to answer this question in specific cases. It, it's really something that is now you know that's the way to look at the problem. But but I don't have you know a concrete answer for you at this point, except to say, well, that's the right question to to ask. Right. How, I mean, this, in my conclusion, that was really the last point, is that how do you guarantee that the, the network architecture is such that you will have small norm for the function you want to represent? Thank you. So there's a, a wish for a comment um, by Hong Jun. Um, but Eric, you need to tell us when you have to run or leave because um, we, we essentially don't really have an end uh, time for this. I have a bit more time. Okay, great. So then uh, I would ask Hong Jun to comment. Actually, Hong Jun is my wife's name. Oh, okay. That's, that's the way nice. <laughs> <laughs> so she set up this Zoom. Um, so I'd like to comment on the question that Homan asked, uh, namely the Baron norm. The Baron norm as, as is defined is ideal for the regression problems, but it's not for classification problems. I would say for regression problems, it's, it's, prop, it's most likely the optimal because we can show inverse and direct approximation theorems. Um, but the you know, popular applications like ImageNet is a, a classification problem. I don't think we have a good idea how to define analog barrier norm in that situation at this moment. But as a matter of fact, I think it's one of the most interesting open questions. 
can I make a comment on the comment? Because I, 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 you know, I, I, I completely agree with what you said, but I, I thought that one of the question, you know, the question that Uman was asking is that, you know, the, the, the barren norm, again, is not intrinsic, right? Because the space depends on the unit or the architecture of the network that you use, right? I mean, you, you could imagine that if you change the architecture or change the unit, you will change the norm. And, and that, I, I mean, is it, 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 in my mind, that's also a very interesting question, but that's not one that is fully understood at this stage. Well, I, I, as a matter of fact, that's, the, that's one of the key features of these class of spaces. Namely, you do need to associate a particular norm for a particular architecture or particular activation function. Now, in the case of activation function for two-layer neural networks, it might very well be that all these norms are equivalent. They just bond each other by constants. But in terms That's of right. the architecture, yes. yeah, for rich function, the architecture is really very different. Very different, you know, three layers, two layers, uh, you know, infinite number of layers, they all correspond to different spaces. Of course, that's what I meant. And there's a question of depth separation that is, you know, not, not, not so clear, right? Mm -hmm. 